Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm one of the uh, heads for AI at MIT. And I'm Jimin, one of the other co press Yep, and we're super excited about this event today to be working with MIT Quest. I uh, have a lot of awesome speakers lined up for you guys. Um, and yeah, just before we get started, we just want to let you know uh, that after the speakers uh, go, we'll have like a panel discussion. So please like hold your questions till after the speakers have finished speaking. Um, and after this, there will be a reception reception in the atrium after this event. Um, yeah. So first up, the first speaker is Martin Trump. He is currently a research scientist at MIT Quest, and uh, he will be starting over at uh, EPFL uh, next year. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for organizing this event. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I will say, since I'm starting my own lab, if you find what I'm going to talk about interesting, then uh, please consider applying. <laughs> Uh, I should also say everything I'm going to talk about is not just me. This has really been a fantastic collaboration with many, many people over the years. Uh, so yeah, all of, all of, or many of them are presented on these slides, not just my work. OK, so a core goal of our field, and our field here is loosely computational neuroscience, uh, is to model human intelligence as well as the me neural mechanisms that underlie it. We think this is exciting because it might provide us with a computational understanding of intelligence. It might, need to, might lead to the next generation of AI, and potentially in the future could help with things like neural disorders uh, and help cure those, those brain disorders. <coughs> but one core question that I think we're just not really sure on how to engage is how can we tell we're making progress? And so in this talk, what I'm going to propose is, and also show what we have done is, uh, an integrative model testing approach that we've now applied to vision and language, and that I think has really uh, boosted our efficiency in making progress quite a bit. So if you think of modeling primate vision, then the way we think to engage with that is that we should evaluate the model element to all the tests in the field, basically. Like all, all the experiments that anyone has ever done, ideally we would test the models in all of those. Of course, in, in practice, we, we can't do everything, but we should at least not just do one uh, and do as many as we can, I think. In uh, a more empirical form, this plot here is showing the number of neural benchmarks. So it's testing how well models are aligned to the neural mechanisms and the neural representations in the visual cortex. And on the y-axis, it's showing how well uh, the best model out of those benchmarks is aligned with a neural benchmark. So basically, it's saying the more neural benchmarks we have, the better I can predict on a, an uninteresting behavioral benchmark how well your model is going to do. So th this is just one characterization of how more benchmarks are going to help. But it's really to motivate that we should test on all experiments. Yes, it is. And then there's two primary forms of testing that we've done so far. One is to test the behavioral element. So here we show the same images to the model that were shown to humans. And I'm going to show an example of that in a second. And then we test how similar their outputs are. But also we test the neural element. And we do this at the level of spike rates, which previously have been shown to predict behavior. And we're also going to include macaque visual cortex, because that has previously been shown to be very similar to our own visual cortex in humans. And yeah, uh, we do all of this in a platform called BrainScore that I'm going to talk a little bit. And also, Catherine is going to have more details for you. So um, I want to run one behavioral trial with you. So imagine you're the subject, uh, maybe for extra motivation. Imagine you're being paid. Uh, your job is to fixate on the dot in the middle. And then I'm going to flash an image. And you should raise your left hand if you think the image on the left is the most similar, or your hand on the, on the right if you think the right one is similar. OK, ready? Yeah, OK. You all got this. Uh, so if you were a subject, you would not be paid. Uh, this was very easy. If we, the images have changes in the movement parameters, at some point, you're probably going to start making mistakes. Uh, for instance, I think the next one that's coming up, like bear versus rhino, for some of these, you, you might not be so sure at some point. So when you show these to hundreds of subjects on mTurk, you can build what is called a confusion matrix. So here, the different rows in the matrix are uh, effectively the different images, and the different columns are different distractors. So one element in the, in the matrix tells you, for instance, how difficult is it to categorize a, categorize a dog versus a fork, which is pretty easy in, in green colors, or maybe rhino versus elephant, which is more difficult in red colors. So when we run this as a benchmark, then this is our data. To test models on this, we run the same experimental paradigm. So we show the same exact images to the models. Uh, we have them perform a similar task, where they also do a metric sample task. And then they make a similar prediction. So we can also compute a confusion matrix for the models. And then there's different ways to compare them. You can just correlate uh, whether the models make the same mistakes, and that is going to give you a score. And I want to stress that this is not just a test of ground truth performance. It's really alignment to, to human behavior on, a, on an image-to-image -image level. So 
really we want the model to make mistakes if the humans make mistakes uh, because we want a model of humans. One nice thing about this behavioral setup is that we can also run the same task and the same images on our macaque monkeys. So here's a video of a monkey performing the same task. On the bottom, you can see the very same images that you just saw. And they get rewarded with choose and get a green screen if they get it right. Uh, if they don't get it right, they get a timeout uh, in black. And usually, they're pretty eager to, to keep going. What this then enables us is we can, as we show images, we can uh, implant electrodes. And we can record the neural activity in their brains. So these are going to be electrical signals. Uh, I don't have enough time to uh, detail everything here. but we can convert those into spike rates, which, which tell us how active a particular neuron is at a given time. So the way I like to think about that is, per image, it's going to give you a vector of activations or of activity. So at the end, you're going to get a matrix of images times neuron, where each element in the matrix tells you how active a particular neuron is for a particular image. And again, we can run this on models as well. So we can show, again, the same images. In the model, we can now record from different areas. Uh, again, there's different ways to do this. Uh, just imagine there is a particular layer in the model that we like. And that is going to be the prediction from the model. So these are now internal layer activations from the model. And we're going to compare those to the data. Uh, there's many different ways to do this. I like one that is called neural predictivity, where we basically try to predict the activity for unseen images. And then again, we get a similarity score. So putting this all together now, uh, I'm going to show you model scores on different benchmarks. Uh, I, I should say, in visual cortex, there's roughly four cortical areas called V1. So that's early visual cortex, going up all the way up to uh, IT. That's high-level visual cortex. That's basically what is involved in human object recognition. And I'm going to show you the scores of one particular model. So this is a classic neuroscience model that people developed in the 2000s, which was considered to be really state-of-the-art. It's doing OK on maybe the early benchmarks, but especially as we get to high-level visual cortex and behavior, it really doesn't do well. Here's all the models that computer vision has developed. Uh, you can see they're doing a lot better. And in fact, the current state of the art models are of neural and behavioral element are models uh, that are yeah, deep neural networks trained on uh, a computational task. We also show all of this on uh, our website called brainscore.org. So I encourage you to check that out after the talk. Uh, and yeah, it always lists the current best models on basically all the different benchmarks that we have. And I want to point out, what previously was a PhD, a PhD project where you test some models or maybe one benchmark, uh, you can now just run in a couple of hours on this website. So I really think this makes it much more efficient for our field to make progress. And yeah, it also enables us to uh, compare all these models in a unified manner on all the real benchmarks. And to make sure that the models really are correct and to also show where the weaknesses are, our community is adding more and more of these benchmarks. Currently, we're at over 50. Uh, and of course, we, we want to add m many more. So what this also enables is when we average across all the different scores, uh, one, one dot here is going to be one model. So across all the different models, we're going to get a, a range of scores. But now you might wonder, is there something that explains why some models are better than others? And from Pierre's work, uh, what has been suggested is that perhaps optimization for a task, such as object categorization, might be a predictor. And indeed, we found that models that are better at ImageNet, so this is a large scale computer vision database, uh, models that are better at classifying images in this, in this uh, ImageNet competition are also the models that are more aligned to, to behavior. Uh, yeah, but still, they're not perfect. Uh, and also, the latest ones are actually not much better. So machine learning is optimizing on, on the x-axis. They're building better and better models. But after some point, the best models actually uh, start to be not aligned to brilliant behavior anymore. So th there's really still a bit of mystery, but uh, at least from a from the low performance regime, you can improve your models by just optimizing on this computer vision task. Yeah. Uh, OK, so this was vision. I, in my like, remaining 10 seconds, I want to briefly tell you about language, because one power of this approach is that it very easily channelizes across new domains. So here the question is, as we use models from the natural language processing community, can they be any similar, or can they predict what processing in the human uh, brain or the human language system is going to be like? Here, the data is going to be mostly fMRI data, uh, as well as ECOG recordings. Roughly, these are non-invasive methods. Uh, ECOG is invasive, but fMRI, you can you just go in a scanner. Maybe some of you have, have done those. Uh, so the y-axis here is going to be how well the models are aligned to neural measures in the human language system. And again, of course, multiple brain data sets. I think that is important, because then we can have some confidence that the results are general. And turns out, some of the models are actually really good models of the human language system, especially GPT-2XL, uh, which many of you have probably heard about, is, quite, is coming quite close to what we've, what we've measured in the brain. 
Uh, and again, we find that there's a normative task that tells us what models are better. In this case, predicting the next word seems to be a, a powerful predictor of which models are going to be best aligned to the human brain. OK, I've definitely run out of time. Uh, what I'm hoping you can take away from this is that as we add more and more benchmarks together, I think that is going to enable us to make meaningful progress. Uh, and BrainScore is one implementation of this approach. It's currently the largest scale version in, in vision and language. It allows us to identify the most brain-like models, provide empirical constraints for new models, and we can also discover these relationships, for instance, between uh, object categorization and brain alignment or next row prediction and brain alignment. Uh, everything is open source, and we could really use your help, and I think Catherine is going to say more about that. Thank you.